be here with you guys today. Yeah, and a very special thank you to the Utah Disney team for all the special arrangements. Yeah, my name is Tiffany, right? Um, before we start, let me introduce about myself. Okay, uh, previously I was actually, uh, let me share with you some of the slides. Previously, I was actually a financial controller for ET Education Group and um, before that, I was work as a regional accountant um, for a few large multinational companies such as HP, the US-based computer hardware manufacturer, Bray Logistics, the UK-based bulk logistics provider, right? And um, the, this company is actually very unique. The company is actually um, to transport um, flexi tank and ISO tank. As you can see, this is actually the ISO tank. So the company transport wine and non hazardous liquid from port to port. So you know you may find that the wine is selling at a premium price simply because of the markup resulting from the logistics, marketing, and also the import tax. Okay, and before I join in tea. I was actually attached to this company. I'm sure you have seen issues everywhere, right? So when I tell people that I work for this company, sure away they will tell me, oh my, your shoe is so expensive, 100 plus ringgit for a pair of plastic shoes. I can get the same shoes in Pasar Malam for just 30 ringgit, right? So one day, my uncle went to Bangkok for holiday. He also bought, bought a pair of big plastic shoes from the uh, Chatu Chat weekend market because his shoes were broken. So about an hour later, he told my auntie that he couldn't walk anymore because he started to feel the burning sensation from his shoe. The shoe is actually melting. Yeah. So there's actually a difference between the real and the fake crop shoes. You know, in China, there's actually 54 companies that actually, actually imitate the shoes that you know produced by crops. And five of them are the premium grade. That's so why you can see some of the shoe why it is so real and look alike because these people they are actually mirroring and do the imitation exactly. All right, and I'm also the author for three financial books catered for three age group, which is the kids from the age of uh, for for primary school from the age of seven until twelve. The teens one will be from secondary school from uh, 13 years old until 17. And if you are 18 and above, then the youth book will suit you better. Yeah? Okay, now, last time when I was uh, working for Crocs, I was actually stationed to a few countries to help them to implement the um, financial setup. And um, so one of the countries that I was actually stationed to is actually to Shanghai. I was there for about a year. So during, after office hour, I like to go around exploring the city sector. And to my surprise, the income gap between the rich and the poor are very, very big. Yeah? And the rich ones are super rich, while the poor are very poor. In Shanghai, you can find people driving a brand new Porsche Cheyenne, Ferrari, Lamborghini, Nissan Infiniti, any luxury car you name it, you can see it on the street. While the poor one will happen, what do they do? They drive. Do they drive a car? They don't. They take a bicycle. And some of them, they actually just walk to work. And then while the middle class, usually they will take a public transport. As you can see in the picture, this is the development now in China. So China is no longer a very undeveloped area. They are actually very developed and in fact, you know, in Shanghai, they're much better than Malaysia in a certain area. Yeah. So, China actually went through an economy reformation in 1978 by Premier Deng Xiaoping. In 1992, Shanghai government announced that the Putong area, which is what you see in the picture, they actually transform it into a new financial district. So, many farmers become very, very rich over a short period of time because their farmland were being compensated with cash, the government gave them cash, and 
they will also be given a free condo. How nice, right? You can have land and then the government gives you a free condo. So that's what happened to the China people. They become very rich over a short period of time and, and they have flooded with a lot of cash. They don't know what to do with the money. So what happened? They went to uh, property speculation. So they just follow the crowd. Oh, whichever there's a new development, they just go around and follow them to do a put down a down payment to invest. Then, with that extra cash, they also go and buy a luxury car. That's why you see all the luxury car on the street. And while the married man and the married woman, even though they are married, they have mental affairs because they think that money can buy them anything. Right? And some of the people, what they do, they actually go into stock investing. And when they invest, they just follow the crowd. And then they want to understand what is the fundamental and technical analysis. What one very important thing is Malaysia also encountered the same thing in 1994 and 95. You can see people, you know, doing marketing in a in the market morning, and then the auntie, the uncle will say, Hey, you're going to speculate the stock. You know, the stock is very hot now, so everybody just go and buy without a very good understanding what is this stock about. And what happened is actually a slump, right? So this is a very dangerous situation. Okay, and just now one mention is you see the bright side of China. So now we look at this picture. This is the rural area in China. In rural area in China, the people are earning 2,500 yuan per year. We are talking about per year. And if you divide it per month, this person is this family is actually earning 110 ringgit per month. Can you survive in Malaysia with 110? You can't write to it. And this is the real situation that happened in China. While the very rich ones were actually surviving on 500 to 1,000 every day just on food and shopping. So you can really see that inequality for the people that are living in China. So what happened? Many social problems were, subs were subsequently transpired. Yeah, the younger generation they're actually living on a easy credit. These people, they live on credit card debt, higher purchase loan, as well as the mortgage debt. Okay, then a lot of bloggers, they actually go on the internet asking for ways to actually help to reduce their debt. Okay, one of the bloggers even quoted, I have an outstanding of 20,000, but six months later, it was actually compounded to 32,000. From 20 to 32, in six months, half a year, do you think it's very scary? So, he mentioned the bank robbed my money under the broad daylight. But I can tell you, the bank can really come and rob your money, you know. It's not robbing. It's legally taking all you have if you do not manage your finances well. Right? So, must learn how to manage your finances. Now, back to our home country in Malaysia. As you can see, this is what Malaysia achieved today. And Malaysia also went through a reformation, economy reformation that happened in 1986 and we call it New Development Program. Malaysia also have a poverty and Malaysia poverty line stood at 3.8% in 2009 which equals to 228,000 household income. 228,000. That means it's still a lot of people that actually suffer because of poverty. Imagine Malaysia have 28 million people and this 228 thousand people they are actually living very poorly and their average income is only 800 ringgit per month and that's for one family right and also the orang asli they are not educated enough and they are still living in the orang asli camp while many citizens are also still living in the squatters these people they are living in poverty because of the lack of formal education as well as very important financial knowledge okay now if you are observant enough just now I mentioned the China people are living on easy credit and Malaysia we have many youngsters as well as the middle age people they are also living on easy credit this not happened just in Malaysia China or India but it's also happened everywhere in the world okay first what do I mean by they're living on easy credit. They went to swipe credit card, thinking that this is actually free money and never bother to pay back. So when the bank call them, they just ignore their call. Secondly, they go on higher purchase loan 
to buy a car, thinking that, you know, uh, because of the peer pressure, thinking that, you know, if I have a car, I would actually look good. Instead of a national car, some of them go for what car? They go for Japanese car, foreign car, you know, go for Volkswagen so that they can just show off in front of a friend and tell them, hey, I do better than you, or I want to look cool in front of you, right? Then third one, okay, so third one is actually property. So people want to learn how to do investment, but they, do, they, they are lazy. They just want to follow the crowd. Hey, there's a, you know, project air uh, happening in somewhere, and then why, why not we just follow the crowd and invest? But investment, people will tell you, oh, this you don't have to pay, that you don't have to pay. But still, there are some costs happen there are some costs that you have to pay and these people without knowing it they just follow blind. When it comes to commitment of cost, then they have to take their head, you know, how am I going to come up with that amount of money to invest? So many of you would actually go into the workforce, right? And how many of you are still students? Can you raise your hand? Keep the hands up. Wow, the majority of you, right? And yeah, we'll be going to the workforce pretty early, very soon. And some of you may actually be in the workplace, like you know, the parents. Yeah. So by committing yourself too early into all these financial debts without understanding your true financial situation, you're actually putting yourself into very high risk. Because if just like the balloon, if you keep on blowing the balloon without realizing it's limit, what happened? The balloon will burst, right? Yeah, so that is very important. You must learn how to manage your money. When we were born, we actually given three report cards. Do you actually know that what are the three report cards? The very first one is actually your academic report cards. What is your academic report cards? That's where all of you are standing. You are sitting here, right? You are actually in Utah. So the college provides you with education so that when you are graduated, you get a job, right? You get a job, you go through all the interview, you'll be given a job so that you can secure the very first step, which is you can be employed in the job market. Second, when you were born, you are actually given one card. The moment you step out from the hospital, you'll be given that card. And what is that card? Can anybody make a guess? What is that card? You come out from the hospital. Your parent will hold in that card. What is that? Your health report card, right? So your parents will give you the card so that your parents will follow the immunization schedule so that you'll be protected against major diseases. That's why the baby are very poor thing. You'll find that the baby, wow, the baby enjoy life so much. And actually, they suffer a lot. Every month, they have to, the parents have to bring the baby to the hospital or to the clinic to, you know, jab the bottle. So they always go, wow, right? Okay, you know? So this is the report card. So when you become an adult, what happens? Will the parents taking care of the immunization for you? No, he will just remind you. But you, as an adult, you have to take over this responsibility, right? Now, one very important report card that the parents or the school will never award you. What is that report card? Can anyone make a guess what is that? Very important, and you are here today. Your financial report card. Okay, that's determine how successful you are, right? When you go to school, you get a very good grade, but doesn't mean that you are even though you may be smart, but that doesn't mean that you are successful. How people determine a successful person is by looking at the financial report cards. So you must learn to have a good report card because everything that you do involves money. The moment you step out from your house, everything will cost money. You need to drive, so what is the cost? Your petrol cost, right? And then if you want to take a public transport, you incur bus fare. So everything that you do will involve money. So learn to do uh, well with your finances, manage your money better so that you can live a secure future where you can actually rely on. Yeah? Now, let's start the financial journey today. Okay, let's see. What is money? Have you ever think of how money is being transformed to today's money? How money, all the currency trading has been? Transpired to today? Currency? No, okay. In the beginning, people lived as a family. They were completely self-sustained because they either found or they made themselves everything. Right? During the Stone Age. 
Yeah, and then slowly the population grew bigger with extended family. Around 9,000 BC. Right? Around 9,000 BC, people develop farming. So they do still they don't do everything themselves, they do not cut everything themselves, but they do just specialize in one job. See, for example, if I put in hunting animals, so I hunt animals. And if you put in uh, doing farming, yeah, you put in uh, doing vegetable, uh, plant veggie, so you plant veggie. So at the end of the day, they are actually trade what they want in exchange for another thing. So this is called the buttering. Okay, as you can see in the picture, yeah, the guys are actually doing buttering, which in the layman terms we call it trading. So they actually exchange goods, rice, wheat, a lamb. Yeah, but there was still problem because I may not want the big lamb that you have the quantity and the uh, the product that you offer me. So they went into a haggling, which is a negotiation process to agree on a deal. But still, this doesn't solve a problem. Okay, then around 1200 BC, the Chinese invented currency, or we call it money today. Yeah, the Chinese use the curry shell. Okay. okay, the first picture is the Chinese invention. They use the curry shell or the metal tools to use as money. And the picture down there is actually the Native American, they use polished volcano rocks as money. So money become a media of exchange to represent how much each thing worth. Say for example, if just now the lamb would be worth like maybe five stone, yeah, and then your rice will worth maybe two stone. So they are exchanging to find an equivalent value in between. But still, there's also a problem there because this uh, shell is not easy to be because they are uh, objects, so it's not easy for them to actually divide into a smaller amount in order for them to give a change. Just like today, we have one ringgit, we have ten notes, you know, ten dollars notes, we even have uh, coins. So this one is for easy exchange, but those days they do not have all these things. So what happened? So around 700 BC, the Chinese is the first one to actually start up with making metal coins. And then with the metal coins, um, the Lydian, which is the Turkey today, they also started with this process. And with the metal coin they, they are making, they actually weigh how much is the metal coin weight, and then they stamp on it with this value. Yeah, just like similar to today's coin. That's where the money is probably being traded. And slowly, gold will actually intru introduce yeah, in, into the marketplace. I think this gold you can see in the traditional Chinese uh, movie, right? They always use this kind of gold for trading. Yeah? So, um, with the gold trading, but because carrying gold is dangerous and cumbersome, people can easily steal your gold away. So, that's why in 118 BC, they are very close to uh, you know, uh, the, the newer generation. So, this, uh, the Chinese actually invented again, okay, uh, the paper notes. So the paper notes, those times is actually 30 cm long of deer skin. They use the deer skin as a paper note. Yeah, but deer skin is very smelly, right? So that, that happened to, to those days. Yeah, then followed by the Italian trader, they also started using notes. They call it bill of exchange. So, so what happened is then, the money has been slowly, slowly transformed into today's currency. So what happened to the gold then? The gold were actually kept in the bank. Yeah, they trade bank as a safe place to keep their gold. And people can easily and freely trade that with their paper notes and coins. Yeah. And then in 1931, the UK left the gold standard. That means gold is no longer backed up by the notes. Then followed by 1971, the US also left the gold standard. So you'll be wondering, so the notes is going to be back by what? Do you have this question in your mind now? So if, if gold and, and paper notes are no longer back by each other, so what the notes is going to be back by? 